Hello there, Peabody here. Once again, it is time to take another revealing peek back into history. What famous date shall I set it to today, Mr. Peabody? October 19th, 1780. Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, The Other Side. Uh, that was just a little, uh, a little play on timelines there, but uh, one thing we wanted to do is um, adjust everybody's um, memory to how a lot of this actually started, and, and um, y you hear a lot of things that uh, people are saying, and you hear a lot of things that really aren't true, but we just want to refresh everybody's memory, so that's why we, we ventured into the Wayback Machine tonight, Bob. Um, <laughs> we're going to go back to uh, somewhere around April, April 10th, and um, what people forget to remember is that the school committee that I was on, the school committee that you were on, were not part of Dr. Hicks's leaving the district. No, or not getting, at all. Pu getting pushed out of the district, as you said. Let's go back to April of 2010 and see who was on that school committee at that time. Um, there was uh, Peter Rock, John Howard, Chris King. Uh, <clears throat> I forget Mr. Liberty's first name. I'm sorry. Matt. Matt Liberty, Marie McDivitt, uh, Martin, and Nordquist. At that point in time, he was given a vote of, we're not going to renew your contract. I don't think it was a vote of no, no confidence. I think it was just that, we're not going to re renew your contract. No, the evaluations, um, I, I went back and looked at the evaluations, and the evaluations at that time, they just weren't there. What, what they were hoping for and what they wanted for, to move forward with Dr. Hicks, it just it, it wasn't there. Okay. So here we are back in April of 2010. We have a, that school committee was the one that really said, we don't want you here anymore. They, they basically closed the door, yes. Okay. So he wasn't pushed out. He was voted out. No. Contrary okay. to Dr. Hicks's uh, proclamation at the meeting, um, he wasn't forced out. This is just a normal procedure. Okay. If you're not doing what the school committee felt he should be, where he, we should have been at that point in terms of the district, not only the district, but in terms of doing his job, that, then that job, you just you get replaced. I mean, it's just like any other business. Okay. So we moved from April of 2010 to May of 2010. That's when the vote was? The vote was uh, five to two. Well, it was no, four. The, no, May, May of 2010 was the, was the new school committee oh, oh, the new, oh, the new, okay, the okay. new, okay, I'm, sorry. We're not really concerned about what the vote was as far as, it, it, yes, as it, far was as five, Dr. it was five to two. So now we have a new school committee of May of 2010, which was the addition of, of yourself and, and Matt McCarthy. Yep, that's correct. Okay. So in June of 2010, Mr. L Mr. Liberty leaves to take a position out of state. So that left an open spot. Mr. Peter Bowler was uh, placed on that. And that's June of 2010. June, January of 2010 at a school committee meeting. Um, now, this is when we're into budget process. This is when we got into the budget fiasco. Right. It this is the start of it, January of 2010. This was the beginning of a lot of things that went down and continued to roll from there. Correct. Yes. So I, rem I attended some of those meetings. Yeah, you, I, were, you were active at a lot I, of those I meetings. I think Mr. Cote was involved and sat in some of those meetings yes. as well. This is where we had the, it changed every week budget. It started, uh, oh, we're going to lose 12 to 17 absolutely. teachers, and then one, the next week it was, uh, we're going to have to get rid of sports and the band, and then there was, you know, I'm not going to be here, we're going to need a proposition, we're going to need an override. All that kind of stuff, correct? It was like three or four, maybe five weeks in a row. Well, it got very. It, the thing that was so ridiculous about that whole budget scenario at the time was the fact that Dr. Hicks was coming to us, and, and each meeting we would sit down at, we were going to meetings quite a bit at that time because we were going through the budget, trying to finalize the budget. And Dr. Hicks would come in, and we wouldn't see the budget physically until we sat down at the table in front of all the in front of all the you know the, the public at the school committee meetings. And every time we sat down at the budget, line items would change. Line items would constantly change until it got to the point where I said to uh, our business manager at the time, I said, listen, can you please put this on a PowerPoint? Let's show the crowd what we're seeing, and maybe you can walk us through this. Or Roger Pomperon, who was our business manager Correct. at that time, could walk us through this. And when we finally did sit down to do that, Matt, Le uh, Matt Baldock, who was I IT director at the time, he's a technology um, the technology guy for the school district, and he said, this took me over eight hours to do. And I said, why? And he said, because the, Roger and Ralph had me constantly changing numbers around, moving things around. So it was eight hours to basically do a plug-and-play budget. I mean, you pretty much know what your budget's going to be, sure. or at that point you should because you're, to, you're presenting it to the public. And he said it took him eight hours to put that together. 
And like I said, every single budget was different. I mean, we we go through this, and Doctor Hicks. I, I remember sitting there. Doctor Hicks sitting there at one of the meetings. He totally he totally blindsided us when he came out, and he he said to us, he said, um, we went from laying off twelve to seventeen teachers, which at one point I said that's that's not acceptable. We need to take a closer look at this budget. To we're going to get rid of the sports and music program as a possibility, and of course the place erupted and it went nuts, and you know we're not right. going to do this to the kids, and and it's like totally caught us off guard. And then you can pick it up. You can pick it up from there. Right. So it's the, the sky is falling mentality. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Chicken Little would have been busy in that, <laughs> okay. in that district. So you took it upon yourself at that time, and I, and I remember being there, make a suggestion of, <clears throat> you know, instead of losing teachers through the budget cut, take a pay freeze, that type of thing. You know, work, try and get the union to work with the school committee to, to and the district to try and level off the budget. And a matter of fact, at that meeting, the minutes from that meeting said, Mr. Serba said he has a real problem with reducing teachers and said that the teachers must cooperate and take pay freezes as well as contribute more for health insurance. So this was in 2010. Um, he said it was not unreasonable to ask this of the teachers since other town departments have taken pay freezes and said he feels the school district will be destroyed if they don't cooperate in negotiations because we were being told at the time that this is it. You know, we're, you know we're, we're in dire straits, and, and this is how Dr. Hicks put it to us. It's how he put it to everybody at the meeting. We knew this was a financial crisis at that time, not like what we're facing now, but certainly he was trying to, to get us to buy into an override, to keep from laying off teachers, then it was to keep from destroying the music and the sports program. Okay, so we, right, right now we know that he said anything from 12 to 17 teachers and a bunch of other stuff to, hey, we're going to need an override. That's correct. Okay, so now you make that suggestion of pay freezes in january of 2010 at the same time right there's a there's a committee formed to for a superintendent search correct, That's correct. okay so we pay and this is to replace dr hicks so right. we pay uh i think it's mas masc ten thousand dollars ten thousand dollars to do a school committee a uh, school superintendent search for us now or, well now i shouldn't say search to collect the resumes, correct? Right. They, what they were doing was the way this, the way a superintendent or any kind of a search committee works is a lot of times a school committee themselves will take on that 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 task of going through all the evaluations and all the resumes. Now, keep in mind, one of the resumes we we actually saw once they finally winnowed the process down and gave us the group of people that they thought were best suited for the job. One resume was 85 pages. I mean, some of these resumes were very, very extensive, so that kind of helped us. And what, what the MASC does is, for this money, they go out, they do the advertising, they do, they do the basic search, they, they take all their information and they try to give you the best candidates and bring the best candidates forward. And I think there was, I could be wrong, but I believe there was probably, I think, eight to ten candidates. And from that pool, it was our job to then go through the resumes, do the searches online, um, you know, do all this information and try to find and try to find the best candidate. All right, so let's go. Let's hold on to the best candidate. Okay. Because I have a feeling this is going to come back. Right. <laughs> bite us in the ass. Well, no, it's not nece <laughs> not necessarily that, but I th I think this person's name came up one time before six yes, years did. previous. In two thousand four. Right? Uh, no, we'll just leave it okay. there. Let's okay. Let's just leave it there. Okay. So we form a committee. All right. And on that committee is uh, Mr. McCarthy, Mr. Serber, Mr. Rock. From the school committee, school committee, That's correct. Donnie Berthium from the the select board, Leo Fared from the East Brookfield select board, an administrative teachers, uh, and two parents as part of the group. Yep, as, as best as you can remember. That's yeah, Mr. Grady was for the teachers. Mrs. N uh, Joyce Nelson, who was a teacher at the time, uh, there was also another pre another teacher, and Dave Bashant was one of the administrators. Okay, so at this point, the committee's formed. So between. February of 2010 and April of 2010, you guys whittle a, a, a you know, a bunch of resumes down right. to a total of three. We had, I think, I think we had. Uh, oh God, I'm going from memory here. Um, there was, I think, three. There was three finalists. We interviewed a group of people. We interviewed a number of people. We interviewed, the, I think, the ten candidates we initially interviewed, and from that we got it down to it. I think it was like three people that were. I think there was three or four people that were left. So from from April. Of 2010. Now we're in February of 2011. I'm guessing that really should be. Yes. Yes. Right. So we go from April of 2010 to February of 2011. We have a committee formed, correct? Mm-hmm. And no, this was two thousand. That would have. 
Wouldn't that have been? Yeah, you're right. You're correct. You're correct. Right? Yep. Or is that April of 09 to February of 2010? No, because it was 2010 I was on the committee. It was 2010. No, you're right. It was 09. You're right. Okay. So April, May, and June of 09. And now we're into January, right? Yep. So now we're into January and February. Now we're into April. You guys have already whittled down that list of, of uh, resumes down to one. And you all choose Dr. Naaman as a unanimous choice, correct? That's correct. Okay. Well, we've covered a lot of ground in just a year. So now, now we're into April of 2010 again, and what happens? The union files a labor a grievance against me. And this is to go back to the, to the January meeting, mm -hmm. or February meeting, where you made mention of, well, there was a few other things that was involved uh, <laughs> in that. But anyways, there's a... There's a uh, that was what I was taking, that I was yeah, taken so to task was, on. Yes. For asking, because I was, being, I was being told at the time that because I was their employer, quote-unquote employer, Correct. that I didn't have a right to ask union, the union or the teachers by proxy, the teachers, to take a pay freeze or to take a pay cut. Correct. Which is really or, not... Or you, put more... You in, really can't be talking about that as a school committee member and, and, and open set. That, cause that's a, well, yeah, but at the time, kind of a violation. when it first came up, the first time it came up, to me, it was just a common sense kind of thing. It's like, well, look, we're looking at losing 12 to 17 teachers. And the irony here was this had happened, I think, a year, a year prior to that. They were gonna, a year or two prior to that, they were going to lose like five teachers. And the same issue came up, and the but, union said, absolutely not. We're not, we, gonna, we're not going to we, do that. But what we know now is that there was never any chance to lose 12 to 17, 12 to 17 teachers. We didn't know that, no. We were being told Hi that. Well, exactly. What I'm saying is hindsight being what it is, in those few months in between, there was really never any chance of that, right? No, absolutely not. Okay. Not, not, what, not what we know, know, we know <laughs> now. Yeah, if I look back in the, you know, the, the, the Peabody Wayback Machine and jump in there, it's uh, well, like, that's what, absolutely. That's, that's kind of why we're doing this. But it, Yeah, absolutely. Okay, because you went by what you were being told and what you saw in the budget. By Dr. Hicks, correct. Correct, okay. So... Now, you have, there's a grievance filed against you, mm -hmm. and at the same time, the existing school committee at that point, which is, which is seated now, mm -hmm. which contains yourself, also appoints Dr. Naaman as the, the, the new, new superintendent. superintendent. So now we're into April of 2010. So between February, March, April, and now we're into May because of the lawsuit you resigned, mm -hmm. which I can understand that. You know, I, I, I told you at the time I didn't think it was you know, good for you to do that, but I can understand the reasoning for your family and stuff like that. Well, I got that from a lot of people. I mean, the problem was, and what it came down to, was a lack of support by the school committee. There was no support on the school committee side. There was no support on Dr. Hicks's side, certainly, because I was being a thorn in the side by questioning everything that was going on at the time, from the budget to uh, making cuts to losing teachers to everything yep. else. And what it basically came down to was without any support from the school committee and our attorney. I spoke to uh, James Toomey. It took him four days to get back to me when he finally did. I said, listen, I'd like to file a countersuit because the union had started this process back in the previous September when I had first got on the committee by yelling at the committee and basically breaking the CBA agreement and saying, you know, this is for the kids, it's, which it always is, God knows. And they kept hammering us and, you know, you need to get this, this agreement done. And, and that's illegal. You can't talk about things in those parameters. At that time, I didn't know that. Okay, I had absolutely no idea about that and didn't understand that until after the lawsuit was brought against me. So when I brought this up to, to Toomey and I said to Toomey, look, let's counter him because they've done exactly the same thing. His answer at that time was, we're too close to an agreement. And the agreement ended up being the teachers ended up getting a raise and no more, no, no more of an input into health care than they started with. So it was like, it was once again, the union got exactly what they wanted. And that school committee did not move forward at all in terms of what the next school committee did. Okay. So now we're into, that's May of 2010. You resigned. There was an opening. I applied. Two other people applied. We had to go in front of the, the, uh, yep. the select board uh, by a, a, a margin of five to one. The, the, the Spencer Select Board appointed me to replace you. Um, then I had to go through another election after that. Yep, because so, you have to do it if, if there was two years left so each a, year. Because it was an appointment. You have exactly. To, you, okay, so I run again, and that was in May of 2011. Right. Get reelected. So now we're into, now we're into a school committee of, of um, myself 
in, in Matt McCarthy and John Howard, Mary Gershman, Josh Cote, Chris King, and Kurt Nordquist. Mm -hmm. That's where we are right now, May of 2011. Okay? Um, and why would you bring that up, Paul? Because, well, because we didn't have anything to do with it. Thank you. Thank you. And that's, that's I'm getting tired <laughs> of hearing in the paper and seeing in the paper, you know, well, Josh Cote and Mary Gershman and Paul Forney are nervous. But no, no, no. And I've apologized uh, publicly. I've apologized to, to Matt McCarthy publicly over this thing. And it's like, look, it, sorry we, got, we hired the wrong guy. You know, you, you, you want to, and I said this from the very beginning when I got up at the meeting and said, if you want to blame somebody when the school, when the, the teachers, and it was a large majority of teachers were actually applauding over at that, well, at that time was a $2.1 million deficit and they were applauding. And I said, you all ought to be ashamed. And then I said, you know, if you want to blame somebody, I said, blame me. I said, because I was on the committee that hired them. I said, these folks up here, they, they, at, least, at least three of them weren't even on the committee at the time. Right over everybody said it's because it's easier to blame people who are there at the time for you know for things that were done prior to their being there. Sure, uh, and I'm not I'm not sitting back saying that I wasn't part of. I was involved in the budget process. Okay? Absolutely, I saw the budget. I looked at it. There was myself. There was uh, two other school committee members. We sat we sat on that on that committee. We worked on the budget. We saw the numbers. There was one school committee member who had his doubts of <coughs> on some things. Well. Don't you know he passes his questions off to Mary Brainy of the Finance Committee? And you know what happens? She never gets back to him. He had concerns of a couple of things. We want you to look and at And this, this was long before. Let's be real before. clear about this. Yes, this, was this was long before, before yes. this whole fiasco happened. We passed happened. this off. This, the per, this person passed this to this Finance Committee and said, can you guys take a look at this and get back to me? Never happened. And nobody ever got back. Never, nobody ever got back. That being said, we, the, the, the three of us who were on that budget committee at the time sat down, looked at the numbers again, felt somewhat, m mostly comfortable with what we saw. Mm -hmm. Okay, Didn't have, really have a problem with and it. And understandably so. I sat in on, on those budget meetings as well as Mary Brainy, as, Mary, as well as Leo Fayad. I, I remember the PowerPoint presentations. I we remember, sat in. We all, we all they, watched it. They were all there. The numbers looked in line. And although we had a couple of questions, they seemed to get answered, didn't really have a problem with it. The real thorn in, in this, or the real problem in this, was the hiring of people behind our backs that totaled an, a, a, a huge amount of money, more than what we had allocated for. More than what you budgeted for. for. We budgeted for four hires, four. Okay, he hired behind our backs um, a, a school. Uh, I think it was a music teacher. I can't even remember. There's just so much information. There was there was so many people that were hired. It was ridiculous. The, this person was hired at a at a eleven L, in in it was step eleven. Uh, longevity. You might want to tell it's, folks at home what, what that really means. It, it, the, the teachers have steps and lanes that they can change to based upon. Uh, their schooling mm -hmm. and how long they've been in the district and stuff like that. This person was hired right from the get-go, right from another school district as 11L. That's it. You can't go any higher. Which Normally, is a teacher of some seniority. A teacher of some, some Which seniority. Which means a higher talking, pay, too, also. Correct. You're talking a teacher that's probably <laughs> been in the system, I'm going to guess, 20, 25, 30 years, ready to retire. But this one, this is the kind of stuff that happened because... you. You can't control what a superintendent does. The superintendent ha can do whatever he wants. And the only way we saw it was through the expenditure report and seeing negative balances. And this was after like two months. So September, October. And Mr. Nordquist was one of the ones that mentioned it. We had, f we had started following it before that, but Mr. Nordquist was one of the ones that mentioned it. But it was like way out of control. I mean, it was like a negative $300,000 after two, two months. Crazy money. Crazy, crazy, crazy. And then as this all started to unravel, it was an, an enormous amount of, of hires that the school committee that I was seated on at the time didn't even know about at all. Nothing. And that's not unusual, unfortunately. That's, that's one of the things that I came to find with, with Dr. Hicks um, 
was what it was what was going on with the budget. Everything else, I got to say, Dr. Hicks was always good about. If something happened at the school, if something, um, if there was something we needed to be made aware of, if there was an incident at the school, if there was, you know, if there was anything, it, it, no matter how minor it was, if it, if it was there's too much snow on the roofs, Dr. Hicks would always get to us. But when it came to the budget, and this is what people at home don't really understand, <laughs> you can move numbers around as a superintendent now. I'm not going to say that's because uh, we've talked to several people. It's not illegal, but it's at the very least, it's not. It's not how you should be doing business. When you're running a twenty-six million dollar business, you need to be showing the people who are overseeing that. Co- let's call it a corporation. They have to be able to see in black and white where all these things are going. Now, the budget that Dr. Naaman started out with, and the budget you guys ended up with through all this maneuvering of the finances and the money and everything else, without your knowledge, it, it, it was abs- it was it, well, I don't want to say it was unprecedented, but it was a, pr- a pretty large scale. It was unprecedented. It, it, was, all right, it let's, was. let's call it, let's it's, say it was unprecedented okay. because it the, was an absolutely enormous amount of money and people being hired and people being shuffled around, and there was a lot of other things that were going on with people doing two jobs at the same time. I mean, it was people were being appointed the head of this and the head of that, and it was just there was so many things going on, and everybody seems to think that that this is this is your life, this is what you're paid to do, like like a business manager, like Julie Supernard or or, or like Dr. Malvi. No, this is a volunteer organization, and and one I might add, you can be sued for, <laughs> um, which is always which is always unusual. If I always thought I'd never join the Red Cross because I don't want to get sued for trying to save somebody, and that's exactly what this is. You not only have to worry about making the union angry, but you have to worry about where the money's going. You have to worry about what's going on and being able to decipher all these things. And it's not like this was all laid out. It wasn't like this was all in all the reports all the time. So at the very beginning, when when Dr. Naaman started, everybody's on board. School committee's on board. Selectmen are on board. Finance committee's on board. Everybody's happy. And and from there, things went downhill very quickly. Everybody got to look at it. Yeah. And I went to the budget. I went to the budget presentations. I had people. We had we had people sitting out on the, on the the presentations in the David Prouty High School library. Everybody saw it. It's like not a problem. Okay, I'm just tired of the finger pointing. I'm tired of the people, you know, thinking that we just sat there and did nothing. I have two kids in the district. Josh Cote has kids in the district. Matt McCarthy has kids in the district. Do you really think we just sat there and said, oh, go ahead, Dr. Naaman, spend money any way you want. Go over the budget. We don't really care. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Absolutely not. I get on the school committee with every intention of trying to make a difference, and we did make a difference, okay? We did a lot of things in that year and a half that people have no idea. We we saved $200,000 in fuel because you finally got somebody on the school committee that understood maintenance. That was myself. I'm not patting myself on the back, but that's my forte. Maintenance, physical plant, stuff like that. And the amount of, the amount of, of, of money wasted on, oh, the lack of, on the lack of maintenance in this district is unbelievable. Don't even get me started on the five schools. Well, it's a fix it if it breaks mentality. You know, it's like if it breaks, well, we'll just we'll just go we'll go buy a new one, and that's the way it's always been. And it's, I mean, not to belabor a point, but it's like the thing that I think was the most the most disturbing during this whole process with Dr. Naaman was our superintendent, was the finger pointing and and and, and people forget how fast you guys moved on this once you realized. Yeah. That once you were aware, and it was days. Yeah. Days. It was twenty four hours. Yeah. It was. And I'm not saying we're perfect. I never said I never said our school committee was perfect, but we did do some good things. No, there's you know? no question. There's no uh, question. The maintenance part is one of them. Uh, Matt McCarthy did a great job as far as negotiations are concerned. Um, the, the teachers union came back with some concessions. Uh, at one point, you know, we had a seven hundred thousand dollar health insurance liability. Can you imagine that hanging over our heads? Seven hundred thousand dollars. And what does that mean? Quite frankly, what it means is uh, the seven hundred thousand dollars was carried because of copays, emergency rooms, uh, deductibles. You know, in a perfect world, if everybody in this district got sick all at the same time and used up all this stuff, we were on the hook for you know hundreds of thousands of dollars. But if you look at the trends, it wasn't really any more than a hundred grand. So Matt was able to 
in, in the in that committee was they, they were able to negotiate down from seven hundred thousand to one hundred thousand, saved a ton of money. It's a significant savings. Significant. Okay. He also negotiated the fact the point of extending uh, the, the, with the health insurance company. Hey, give us two extra months. Let our it, and nobody really knows this, but our, our health insurance plan went fourteen months, so we could go on a July renewal rather than the May. Nobody knows that. We've got, we had a 14-month contract of health insurance, which is unprecedented. You can't, normally your health insurance goes from uh, your, your start date to your start where mm -hmm. you, they have a certain entry period. These guys went over past that and gave us an extra two months. So our start date is, uh, entry date is like July 1st. Like, can, and it kind of goes in uh, playing with uh, school contracts and stuff. How often, does, how often do you have even a, a private company be able to extend an entry period of two months? No, oh, absolutely. Well, the other thing th that people forget about is this is also the first school committee that actually got concessions from the teachers in terms of input to health care. That's never happened before. Just, it just hasn't. No. I mean, when the state first started mandating that, that, the t that the teachers actually pay something, they were paying at that point, it was nothing. They mandated you're going to have to start paying a minimum of 10%. Yep. And from there, it went up 5% in how many years? And this school committee got them to make that concession and ended up saving the, the, the first year. It was about $150,000. Yeah, it was, it was, it's a significant chunk of change yeah. that ends up, then ends up getting saved. And it's, 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 it, it, just, it drives me crazy when I hear people talk about this and they're saying, well, it, it was, you know, this committee's done nothing and they haven't done anything. It, it, was, it was absolutely ridiculous. In fact, says here, the committee was also able to cap the HRA reimbursements, which is what you were speaking of, at 100000 for the entire district. Prior to this contract, the district had a liability of approximately 725000 if a perfect storm happened and all employees maxed out their health pays. We're talk their co-pays. We're talking about, uh, to put it in terms that folks at home are going to understand, imagine everybody, every teacher in the district getting sick and being out of school for extended, that's the only way you could max this out. So by doing that, and Matt, who's an insurance broker, when he was on the school committee, looked at that and said, the chances of this happening are, are, are slim to none, and it ended up scaling that back I, and saving I, us I, a I think great Matt's, deal of money. I think Matt's words were perfect storm, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly, that's what he said here. Yeah. Also, it said, finally, what are the projected savings to the district as a result of this new contract? Your one cost, 235000 your two savings, 136,000. Total contract cost, 99,000. So for 99,000, we ended up we ended up spent we ended up garnering almost 420,000 dollars, almost a half a million dollars. And also, if the year one fiscal fiscal year 13 the district paid zero percent cola and steps and lanes under this contract that have already been and are being given to paid to employees in year two fiscal year 14. The we, then we negotiated zero COLA and no steps and lanes along with the health insurance changes. This saves the district approximately $136,000 during fiscal year 14. That's, you know, we're talking about a school committee that actually ended up saving money for this town for the first time in, in, in God knows how long. Um, and ironically, I might add, this the union is now, is now aggressively grieving the lane changes we came to find out at a school committee meeting. And the lane changes, there's steps and there's lane changes, and the lane changes are when, when teachers move diagonally and there's always money involved. Every, every step change and every lane change is an increment. It's, all, it's like a cost, think of it as a cost of living allowance. And Mr. Scortino got zero across the board for, for, pardon me, for steps. So what the union is grieving on is, well, they didn't technically say anything about lane changes. So now think about this, Paul, in the middle of a fiscal crisis, and we are truly in the middle of a fiscal crisis. This is no game. The union's still grieving this. Now, <laughs> and God knows I got a problem with the union, but <laughs> let's, let's stop and think about this now. The union is grieving something in the middle of, of, of a fiscal meltdown, okay? They're saying you need to give us more money. Teachers are out in public, and I've had, I've had a couple businesses now contact me and tell me the same story. Businesses are saying, you know, teachers are coming in here and they're saying, well, we're going to get our raise now the, because, you know, the state's coming in. And a, fr a friend of mine owns a business, and who told you that? And he said, well, Mark James told us that. Mm. Well, there you go. It's like, you know, it's like we're off and running. It's like it's always, it always seems to come down, and this is sad. It's supposed to be about the kids. The town employees have made concessions. Cops have made concessions, and we've talked this before. But this district, the teachers and the union in this district do not feel 
that they need to make any concessions. And not only do they not feel they need to make any concessions, at the last school committee meeting, a woman got up there and said, I'm a teacher, and she, um, she said, I didn't say I'm a teacher, she said, I'm a parent, excuse me, and she said, I don't think teachers should have to pay for our mistakes. It was, it was something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Only to come to find out afterwards she was a teacher. So I'm starting to see this, this, this constant, you know, well, somebody's going to give something up. It's not going to be us. And what did Mark James say the last time he actually publicly spoke? I think it was in January. It was like December or January last year when he said, we need to share the pain. It, it sounds good. It sounds really good on paper. But sharing the pain to Mr. James means you all need to keep putting more into health care. And, you know, we, 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 we just need to stand by and just keep, you just keep giving us raises and, and keep our health care input at this. I can only hope for the teacher's sake that they're right, but I don't, no one knows. The state's only come in five times since 1993. Five times. So this is new territory. I think the last one, the last uh, school, uh, school district where the state came in to uh, take over, I think was... The Quabog District, if I'm not was mistaken. Was Quabbin? Quabbin or Quabbin? Quabbin? Quabbin, I believe. Yeah, Quabbin, they took yeah. over. That was just a couple, that was yeah, just a couple years ago, was right? Quabbin. That yeah. was just a couple years that ago. That was two so. years ago, and if you saw the recent article in the paper, their budget audit was phenomenal. Said it should have been the stellar example of what a, a school budget audit should be. And this is a year after being taken well, over. Well, let's, let's talk about the budget for just... I want to digress for a second and talk about superintendents and... Uh, what their ability is as far as um, line items. And, it, you know, from, from the information that I have and from the information that, was, that I, was, I walked into and I was told, and I remember sitting at school committee meetings and I remember this certain superintendent saying, look, we're just going about this round and round and round. Vote on the bottom line because I can do what I want with the money. <laughs> And he was, it was right. Are you serious? He was, he was absolutely I can do right. what, I, what I want with the money. So do you remember the cup game where I remember? Oh, I, that's probably okay, So that's, that's one of the problems that, that harbors the, the public school systems is that there's a, you, as much as you think that the school committee should have oversight on the superintendent, in all reality, you can't spend 10 hours a day with him. No. Okay? He or she can move money where they want. And, is, and if you can get a line item vote on, on the budget, you're going to have to meet every week. Oh, at the you very can't least. Move one, you can't meet, meet once a month. You have to meet every week. And to back, to back that up, what, what you're saying, the point of this is when you, go to, when you go to a town hall meeting, you show up at a town hall meeting, we always have an incredible amount of line items that we have to vote on, and it takes a long time. And the reason for that is so that every single voter that shows up at this meeting knows exactly where this money's going. It's illegal to move money from, like, say, Adam Garda has a, a, a town highway budget. He didn't use, like, say, $40,000, and he wants to move it someplace else. Well, he can do that with the voter's approval. Correct. And what needs to start happening with the school committee is everything has to be done with line items, and, and especially when you're, when you're signing what we call... Okay, uh, wait a minute. Stop right there. You were on a school committee before me. Yeah. Did you attend some of the school committee meetings before you were actually elected onto the school committee? No. You didn't? No. So you walked into that blind, pretty much. I walked in, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Now, you were on it before I was for a good year anyways. Yeah, for one year. At any point in time, in any of the school committee meetings that you ever attended, were you ever asked to vote a line by line no, item never expenditures no we need to move this from here to here no we never saw the bills shocker we never saw the bills when, when we were talking about warrants at one of the uh, one of these shows and a warrant is nothing more than a bill and you what from what i understand selectmen don't sign any warrants unless they see the bill here's the bill here's how much it owed i'll sign the warrant School committee doesn't do that. When I asked Roger Pomperian at the first meeting, they hand me a book, and he goes, I need you to sign this. I go, what's this? He goes, this is the warrants. You just need to sign these. So I'm, I'm like, okay, where's the bills for these? And he hands me, and I kid you not, a three-ring binder that must have been about three inches thick, and he goes, here you go. And I'm like, well, I don't have time to go through this now. And he says, well, if you don't sign this, we, you know, we can't get this paid. So I said, okay, well, I went ahead and I signed it. But that's... So this is business as usual. Yeah, it's another day at Past the office. Past practice. Yeah. Whatever you want to this call it. This is what's worked before, and it seems to be working now, and well, it's, like, it's, it's not working. It's like three blind mice, well, except, well, there's, except there's seven. Yeah. Right? 
How many are there on the seven? Thing? Seven. So you really, you really don't, you really don't, you don't know all the time what's going on, and and the, the absolute, the absolute height of hypocrisy is watching people who sat in on this budget, who sat in on this budget. Okay, watch this thing being put together. Mary Brainy, Leo Fayad. Leo, who failed to mention, oh yeah, I've got I've got two two individuals who are, are working up at Knox Trail, my sister and my cousin. Forgot to mention that. We got Mary Brainy, who forgot to mention to the public when she saw the original budget when, after we did the budget after the name and left and said, I refuse, you know, we, we're not going to told the FinCom, we're not going to vote for this. And then here we are a little bit down the line in the fall. Oh, nothing's changed in the budget. Okay, we can vote for this now. Now, in my opinion. Maybe it's because Mary's a former teacher for the school district and realized that if the state actually comes in, they may set, because the state can do this, the state can set the health care input. Maybe those seniors who are, who are now retired are going to go from 10% for health care, maybe to 40 or maybe even 50%. Who knows? But it's, like, it's always about self-interest in this district. It's always about what's best for my family, what's best for me. Kevin Hayes hasn't even told, I mean, he may, have, he may have registered with the election commission and said, listen, this is a, con you know, there might be a conflict of interest. Because his wife works Because my district. wife works for the school system. Kevin's for the override. What a shock. And now you've got Mr. Cloutier, who, you know, several weeks ago was, you know, if you want a war, bring it on. Dump all your garbage on us. And now he's got a labor relations argument against him. Not too, not too much different from what I had. So now, all of a sudden, we got Mr. Cloutier, who says that the last two meetings, we can't really pick on teachers. So he's been cowed. You know, Mr. Mr. Hayes has his own set of issues. Mary Brainy, Leo Fayette. It's like, this is like nobody ever just steps up and says, listen, just as public knowledge, you need to know that this is, this is my stake in this. No. We always, we always argue from the, from the point of, well, this is what's best for the district. No, it's not always best for the district. And I just, you know, one time. One time in this district, I would like to see people be honest, from administrators to, to people who are in, in leadership roles to people who are in finance roles. It's like, let's start telling the truth and let people know that, yeah, maybe we do have a little bit of skin in this game. But that, that never happens. It's not going to happen. No. But it's, it, it's going to start happening. Well, we just mentioned it. So it's like, you know, it's time that some of these things start being brought up. So... We I know we kind of digressed there for a little bit, okay. but as far as the timeline is concerned, we've gone from April of 2010 to December of 2010, and by this time, you know, by this time, uh, uh, Dr. Hicks has already left, right? Mm -hmm. And he is now in Ashburnham, Westminster. Yes. Dr. Naiman comes in, takes over. Uh, again, we go through the budget process. We start the school year. By October, November, we're seeing these goofy things in the, in the budget that we had no idea was really happening. We didn't know about t raises. We didn't know about people getting hired. We didn't know about, uh, and that's full-time and part-time. There was $80,000 in raises <laughs> just in the Blue House Listen, alone, that, you know, and everybody was caught off guard. Everybody's like, seriously? Yeah, but, you know, the, the thing is it was part-time, full-time, who knows what. Mm. You know, so we end up putting him on administrative leave, and we everybody kind of knows the direction it goes. Well, let's to. let's read this. It says school committees find out there's issues about Dr. Naiman on December 10th, and on December 11th he is put on administrative leave, pending investigation by the school investigation by the school committee. And the thing that killed me at these meetings, and these meetings were nothing more than a finger pointing exercise, and we heard continuously about. Red flags. There was red flags <laughs> everywhere. Well, you know, that may be, but you know what? Unfortunately, they weren't, you know, they weren't red enough and they weren't big enough flags. And, and everybody's like, the school committee didn't move quickly on this. You can't move any quicker than finding out that there's a problem, that there's, you know, that there's, uh, you know, the rat stealing the cheese and, and you get rid of it immediately. And then, you know, the fallout from that was the next, oh my God, I remember January, February, and March being bloodbaths absolute bloodbaths. People there, just coming out and just yelling at well, you we guys. Could, it was... We couldn't, first of all, we couldn't say anything. You guys, trust me, I no. would have loved to have yelled right back. No, you were, you hey, were but, under, but, under your lawyer, lawyer's but, response telling you not that, to talk that, We had this. to be a little professional. I mean, I wasn't going to sit there and, and kick my feet and hold my breath and, and you know. That like sounds a, familiar. Yeah, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> like, a, like, a, like a little kid, you know, I, I took my lumps I waited to get go. off the board, and then we can tell everybody what goes on. 
you know? And that's, that's the biggest thing, is it, what you can't say when you're on that committee to what you can say yeah, when you're not on the committee. Oh, absolutely. It's huge. Massive. So that's the timeline, folks. April of 2010 until uh, February of, of 2012, really, I guess. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, April of 2009 yep. to uh, January of 2012. It was, it was very quick. There was a lot of things going on. But the, the, the thing that I want to make very clear is that this, the school committee that was made up of myself and Matt McCarthy and Josh Cote, Mary Gershman, Chris King, um, John Howard, and, and Kurt Nordquist were shanghaied by, by one of the best. Okay? Oh, without a doubt. So, and we had nothing to do with Dr. Hicks leaving this district. And I have nothing against... Dr. Hicks. I don't, I don't have a personal relationship with him. I only the time I spent on the school committee and the building committee. It wasn't us. Okay? That was back in April of 2009 from other school committee, from another school committee. We had nothing to do with that at all. Well, I keep reading that in the paper. It was like, you know, and it, the thing that, I guess the thing that really, that really disturbs me about this current committee is uh, and I don't know how many people are aware of this. Uh, Mr. Norquist was on Jordan Levy's show. Oh, wait a minute. No, we, that, that was... <laughs> I, I got a phone call and, and telling me that, some, that uh, <sighs> Kurt was on the Jordan Levy show. So I, I, I want to know. <laughs> I want to know who appointed Kurt Nordquist as spokesman for the school committee and the town of Spencer and East Brookfield, really. It was really. pretty interesting. It, who? it was pretty interesting. Are you kidding me? Well, you, you, heard, you heard the interview. There was Because I've talked to several people. I talked to you after the fact, and I talked to some other people. He talked, he talked about it was negotiations. Amazing. It was amazing. He talked about negotiations. He's a school committee member, and he's on public television. Not, not local television, but public television. Jordan Levy's show carries, I'm guessing, a few quite more. Quite a few, quite a few quite people. A few I guess people. apparently quite a few people do listen to that. Yeah. I, the only reason I did was because somebody called me and said, hey, Kurt's on here. He you went into the from what him. I know he went into the he studio. He was in the studio. Not a telephone call in the studio. Cuz I heard the, the part I came in halfway and Kurt was speaking about this cur current the current school committee and basically saying about the school committee saying, you know, we can't get anything done because the two new members um, the school committee doesn't like them and 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 I just I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. And they're going to you know, you're going to get up in the morning, the town's going to turn the lights off. It's going to be part of our fiscal budget and <laughs> it's going to be dark when you go to work and it's going to be dark when you come home. So I had to assume that it was just going to be dark all the time. <laughs> so I call in the Jordan Levy show and I said I'd like to I'd like to address Mr. Norquist and and we got talking and I said, you know, Mr. Norquist fails to tell you that the two members who came on the committee, the way they came on the committee was they started out by asking everybody to resign. I said, now, if you're going to be conciliatory and say, okay, listen, I'm going to come on the committee, I'm going to see if I can move things forward. Everybody knows how this has been so far. It's been finger-pointing. Um, Mr. Clutie are telling people that he's not going to vote on things anymore, and, and Mr. Hayes saying, well, now you're going to get the state, and you're not going to be happy about it. It's like, just take your ball and go home. You know, it, it's like, I'm so, it's so unprofessional. It's like, you're not going to get anything done by getting on a committee and being the guy that knows everything. Because those two certainly are not in a situation to act like they know everything because these are two guys that are responsible. Well, there's a you history know. there. Oh, there's, the, there's <laughs> the, the, water, the water emergency. There's hiring Carter Terenzini. There's lawsuits against the town. There's ethics violations. I mean, there's the signed bylaw fiasco, which is how I, how I got involved in politics. I mean, it, it's, we're talking about a litany of, of political debris left behind now, these guys have been out of the picture for a few years, and now they come in and they're like, we're the champions. We know what's going on. It's like, nah, you, you know what's going on, but you don't go about it the right way. And the way you do it is you don't go on, on the committee and start breaking eggs immediately, you know, and telling people, you need to resign, and you need to step down. Well, how does well, that I, work I out? Who's going to take this job now? <laughs> do you follow sports radio at all? Oh, yeah. Okay, so there's, a, there's an afternoon show on, and this, what's funny is they talk about um, the New England Patriots a lot. And the Patriots do things different, but everybody else in the league is stupid, and they spell it S T O O P I D. <laughs> stupid. <laughs> okay, and that's kind of how I felt when Mr. Cloutier and Mr. Hayes came on. Everybody on that board was stupid, except for them. Okay, and I, I, I had conversations with Mr. Cloutier and Mr. Hayes, and um, he, he, oh, you're going to be able to do this, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and I'm like, 
have at it. Good luck. You're going to negotiate can, an open session. And negotiate and all an open these s- things are going to happen. And, and I'm not saying that they're not good for the committee. I understand that they're trying to get something done. But to blame other people on the school committee for it's standing their ground and saying, no, look, this isn't good enough for our kids. We're going to vote no. And then to stamp your feet and say, well, that's it. I'm not going to talk about this budget anymore, I think was embarrassing, to tell you the truth. Totally embarrassing. And, you know, maybe the right thing to do would have been, all right, let's, let's you know, put our, 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 our gear back on, put our hats back let's on. Let's get this done. Let's go back and see if we can come up with something else. I mean, some of the things that they cut were just ridiculous. They cut... You know, right now we had a hundred thousand dollar liability for health insurance costs, which again covered the copays and stuff like that. They took thirty thousand dollars out of it, <laughs> and they reduced it down to seventy based upon trends. Okay, so that's not a real. I mean, it it wasn't it it wasn't a shot to our education, but it was also a liability and also kind of put the district maybe on edge. I mean, if something happened where you know, uh, where we had some people get sick. We could have gone, but if it, if it had reached that 70000 and gone over, the district would have been on the hook for that. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So it, it is, a, it is a, a, a mess no matter which way you look at it. And I'm going to, I'll say it again. I said it before, I'll say it again. The, the, the public school system, the way it's run, and the taxation process and everything else that you have to go through, I think is a joke. I think it needs to be... It's broken. I think it needs to be blown up, and I think it needs to be fixed, and I think you need to stop the us versus them mentality of the taxpayers and the union. That's the only way it's going to get fixed. But how do you stop that when, when one side is so, is so argumentative and so... I mean, have you seen the union step up one time during this entire process? All of her teachers complain, I have to sweep my classroom. Well, you know what? Some people should just be lucky to have a job. In this economy. And but, look at uh, how and many I'm gonna, people... No, let me finish. Wait a minute. I'm going to play look, devil's advocate because I don't want just somebody teaching my kid. I want... If you go into the hospital with a heart problem... We've had this conversation Do you want before. Bazooka Joe fixing your heart? You, you want, so how do we know that these teachers are qualified since there's no teacher evaluation in place for the last four years? That's a different story. Years? You need the teacher evaluation. This is the dog... We need chasing, a tool. It's just a dog chasing the tail. Right. We need it. But who's, who's holding that up? The teachers' union. They want to negotiate that. Even though in Dr. Hicks's, Dr. Hicks was still here in 2010, he took them to court and said, and they said, yes, you have to institute this. But, it, and, but again, and but we again, also lose race to the top money if they don't get but it. But again, this is the state putting it back on the towns because they don't. That's, they don't want to they, deal with this. The state says, oh yeah, we're going to institute that, institute that, but, but, we're going to let the towns do it. That would be an unfunded mandate, was what Josh just said to me. And he's, and he's absolutely right. Yeah. And Josh, you can pipe in any time over this loudspeaker. Please, Knock please. yourself out. Again, it's, it's something else that the, you, the feds and the, the feds <laughs> and the, we're going to get all wound up here. We're he's got go a past. sexy voice every time I hear him talking to my ear, I'm losing my but, mind here. But anyways, it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a dog chasing, chasing its tail. That's what the public school system is. Okay? It's become a babysitting service. Not a place to teach become a babysitter. But how service. do we change it? That has to start with, from the top down. It has to start with strong leadership and setting a mandate for the, for the school and for the teachers. Mm-hmm. And we need people that are going to be dedicated well, to get you, this done. Because keep in mind, we're a level three district. We got not one, but two schools that are level three. Yet I hear teachers talking <laughs> and yelling at people every time they, they get up at a school committee meeting. There's a little contingent of teachers that sits up in the right-hand corner as your face is you're looking up from the stage. It's the East Brookfield group that's always sitting there and always shouting something down or talking about somebody. Remember when Gary Woodbury got up there, the chairman of the select board, got up and said something about having somebody sign at the district meeting on the 26th, and somebody, one of the teachers, yells out, here we go. It's like, seriously? So when you're talking about it, us versus them mentality, oh, yeah, it's definitely there. But you know what? This this starts because of bullying, because of intimidation by the union. It strangleholds a school committee that's absolutely afraid to open their mouths because they're afraid they're going to be sued. And because let's face it, did you take on this job because you took on this job? Why, Paul? Because you wanted the, because of books. <laughs> it was because of quite books. simple. It's something it was books. as stupid as I have, that. I have a whole conti- a plethora of books, and the, the reason why I really got involved was because my son came home from Lake Street Library with a library book and must have had 400 pieces of tape on it. I'm like, well, 
what are my taxes going for? Not what, for what are you paying? Certainly okay? not for books. And then when you get on the inside and you see the, the administrators from these schools putting their budgets together and saying, okay, we need this amount of books and we need this amount of books and we need to do this. And then when the, when the uh, superintendent puts the final uh, budget together, what happens? It gets erased. So this is what we're left with. Well, that's the, that's okay, the thing that gets This is what we're left with, first. folks. See this? That's the social studies. That's social studies from the first grade. You want to know what year this was copyrighted? 2000. 2000. Do you want to see? Hold on. Well, look at this. Look at, look at the teacher. Look at, it's a mullet. <laughs> Are you kidding me? There's a, and, and I'm not, this is what they teach with. Okay? Here's another book. This is a reading book. Copyright 2000. I know words don't change, but certainly time frame does between well, 2000 and, 2004 and 2013. What about the books? How many books? Per, I mean, we had this discussion. Yeah. Okay, Josh wants to pipe in. Go ahead. Pipe in. This is Josh Cote. This is our producer, Josh Cote. He's in the booth. Sorry about that, guys. Um, there's a gentleman on the phone wanted to talk about the woman that was in the upper left-hand corner that you were you were talking about um, uh, well right-hand corner from from our perspective uh, he uh, he mentioned that she was it was threatened to her that she was going to leave um, uh, and that actually she worked for mr. Howard right uh, at, at his clinic he wanted to make that point um, and then uh, there was another point which I'll be piping in within one minute. If you just uh, yeah. if you want to comment on that at all, um, I will. Uh, we have we have a technical difficulty. We can't get okay. the, uh, the phone into the into the studio. So not a problem. I'm gonna talk to him for a second, and then uh, I will pipe back in. All right, okay. sounds good. You mentioned we we talked about the book situation when we were doing the show prep, and you had mentioned that there aren't enough books for the kids. Oh, let, you want to go there too? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, Second grade science at Lake Street. And I, and I, I'm, I only have Lake Street stuff because that was the right. easiest one to go through right now. Uh, but I will go through each school, okay? Uh, there, isn't enough, there isn't enough science books for the second, grade, for the second graders, so they have to, they have to switch their, their programs so that at one point, one second grade class is doing science. The next... They, the other second grade classes are doing science. So they, can, so they can share books. Math. Let's go to math. Oh, hold on one second. Oh, Josh, wants to, Josh wants to pipe in. Go ahead, Josh. All right, so this gentleman wanted to make one other comment. Sure. And he actually took um, great offense to my comment uh, that we need to protect the students and the children from the town. Uh, he thought that that was a very bad comment and that it was out of place. Uh, and since we're on the subject of that, I do, since it was me that made the comment, um, I do stand behind that comment because uh, we cut over $2 million out of that budget and we yes, were starting did. to get too deep. Um, he also made a comment that the town does support the schools and has paid over the minimum assessment. He's absolutely right. He... Um, he, he's correct in saying that they've made it over the minimum assessment. The, the state sets a minimum assessment that the town must pay every year. Um, we have paid a very small percent over that. Um, when you look at that, it's like uh, getting a D minus uh, instead of a C or a D or an A. We are at the bottom of the list. And I made this very clear at one of the public hearings. We are at the bottom of the list of the 351 communities uh, that contribute to schools. That's correct. We we're, we're, One year we were seven. One year we were number 11. Um, we're not much higher now. Uh, so the only way that I can, I can explain it is to say it's like getting a D minus. You're, you're not, yeah, you're, you're passing. But you're not you're not passing very well. You're not you're setting the bar job. very high. You're not setting the um, bar. You're, you're, yeah, you're absolutely right. So he he did he had an issue with my comment. He wanted to make sure that we said 
we make the uh, minimum assessment and then some. Um, and Which I want to make sure that, that that is, you know, set. That is true, and, and I had this conversation with Adam on a couple of occasions, and I, don't, I know you have too, mm-hmm. that, and, and, this, and the selectmen are very, very upfront about that, that we pay, the, we pay the minimum state assessment. They do. They absolutely do. Do they need to pay more? Yeah, and I think, and, and, I, and you and I have talked about this before, and, and we've talked about this with Josh on a number of occasions. Um, is the ba- is ba- basically it comes down to this. I think people would be willing to spend more money on the school system if they knew where the money was going. Bingo. And I don't think that's an issue. I, that's never, I, this town, I've never seen, and I've only seen two overrides for this town for the school, and there was never an issue. Or if there, there, I think there was a time when Dr. Hicks came in before I got on a committee where they were asking for a, a small amount of money. And the town did it overwhelmingly, no problem. Yep. The problem now, again, and this isn't an us versus them, but when most of your money goes to pay teachers' salaries, steps, lane changes, health care increases, uh, retirees paying 10% for health care, people including, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not speaking for the selectmen, I'm assuming that this is part of their trepidation with wanting to put more money into the system, is you, you don't know where this money's going. You don't know, because I remember when I told you this before, when, when I said something to Chris King and, and I said they keep talking about $630,000. And Chris goes and, and he said they want half of that. And I said to Chris, what's he talking about? This is Mark James. 315000 and this was half of that last override. They felt that that was due them. When there's savings that comes down through, through, through the health care contracts, where we don't have to pay as much. Uh, the year I was on the committee, we ended up paying less money. What happens? They turn around and they say, well, we want half of those savings. Well, how fair is that? At the end of the day, how do you supply books? How do you pay for maintenance? I, I, I get it. I understand. You know, and that's, in, that's where a lot so, of people's frustration is coming well, from. And that I understand, and I, and I'm, I agree that if, if the taxpayers in the two towns, if there was a plan laid out, hey, listen, we're going to dump $50,000 into books, $100,000 into technology, blah, 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 I think they would probably feel a little better um, Okay. Where their money's going. Uh, they would contribute more. But I just want to touch something real quick. Um, you know CVTE? Mm-hmm. It's headed by the vice principal. Yep, Dave Bashan. Dave Bashan. This, this committee was put together. It's leaders of the town businesses, local town businesses, um, you know, banks, big businesses. They get together, I don't know how often, once every few months, and it was designed to raise money and put money back into technology and stuff like that. Do you realize at one time that that group had put six hundred thousand dollars back Is that into that meeting? Six hundred thousand dollars back into the school department for technology. That's what it was supposed to be earmarked for. Wild guess where it went? Wild guess. Dr. Hicks put it in a general fund? General fund. Because, because he, he felt- <laughs> thought he knew better of where it should be spent. Now we're stuck with computers that are still 10 and 11 years old, okay, that our seniors can't use to do. We, we have opportunities for these kids to do co-op with the businesses in town and in, in, in local areas, local towns. They can't do it. They can't do it because we can't run the flipping software. It's frustrating. It's, it's, it's most definitely frustrating. $600,000. Well, we're running out of time, folks. Yeah. Um, I'd like to thank Aaron Keyes, who's been a really big help since we got this show started. Um, he's been here helping us quite a bit, helping us load the show online. I just want to say thank you, Aaron. We haven't done that the last few shows. Uh, most importantly to Josh Cote, you folks don't hear him the way I hear him, constantly <laughs> babbling in my ear. Josh is the guy that runs this ship, and without him, we'd, we'd definitely be lost. Josh is also a huge part of the show prep. Uh, we sit down and decide what we're going to go over. And, of course, to my, my, my fellow host, uh, Paul Fournier. And you folks, you know, thank you for, for, for tuning in. We've been hearing some, I think, some very positive yeah, feedback. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually, it's kind of, it's a lot of fun. It is, it and has I, been. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, more people get involved because we don't want it to be a typical show. We want it to be I think engaging. that beginning tonight kind of let, let people know it's not going to be a typical <laughs> show. All right, so uh, I just want to say thank you again to everybody. Uh, we're coming to the end of the show here. we got like 15 seconds left, so thank you very much, and we hope we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot, and have a good night. Thank you. We'll see-